Hello and welcome. I'm Zara Sethna, host of the Collapse Life podcast. Our guest today has reported on corruption in science and medicine for many years as an investigative journalist. Paul Thacker is publisher of the Disinformation Chronicle on Substack. And in the past, he's written for the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, and many other outlets. He also led a series of high profile investigations in the US Senate, which led to reforms in medicine and better conflict of interest policies at the NIH. And today he's here with us to talk about one of the most important issues of our time, censorship and free speech. So Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. Um, so your Substack, as I mentioned, is called the Disinformation Chronicle. And that's a word along with misinformation that up until a few years ago, we never really heard before. So let's start just, what's the deal with that? Well, the reason I started it, honestly, was because I had done a lot of work. Um, first, when I was um, uh, more reporting on environmental issues, looking at um, the way corporations create disinformation, I, I'd done a lot of investigations looking into the chemical industry, um, and then a lot of issues involving climate change. And then I, I left journalism for a while and I went to go work in the United States Senate looking into corruption in, in the pharmaceutical industry and in other areas of science and medicine. And what I found is that there's just similar kind of tactics that are used over and over again, you know, despite, you know, the industry that you're looking at. Um, and so I was just kind of, you know, I was like, I realized how all these tactics work. So I realized like how the fake studies are created how the PR companies operate, you know, how, how the academics are, you know, hijacked to promote nonsense. You know, I mean, the, the longest conspiracy we've had in the history of, of America is what tobacco did mm -hmm. starting in the 1950s, um, working with a PR firm Hill and Knowlton to create disinformation around the dangers of um, tobacco, um, which was not exposed actually. And this is another interesting issue there's this idea out there that there's these brave scientists or some brave academic who exposes these things and lets you know like what's really going on. And that's a total lie. Um, what's often happens instead is the academics are hijacked and harnessed to create the disinformation. And the people who expose what's going on are usually lawyers who find stuff out during lawsuits. That's usually how it happens. So I started, you know, just kind of realizing that was my, my expertise was in, but, but what was happening simultaneously was this other kind of thing that's come up, which I call like big disinformation, mm -hmm. which is this entire industry that's created to tell you, you know, what is and what is basically how to think <laughs> is how it really works. And that's a very complicated um, interplay of a lot of different groups that are involved in either creating disin, you know, uh, First off, I think creating disinformation, then labeling other things as misinformation or disinformation. Again, you've got the academics, you've got these this new rise of the fact checkers that are out there um, and uh, government agencies that are directly involved. I think that's one thing that's very different is I never took a hard look at the government's role in a lot of this stuff, which you often find. I mean, traditionally, what I was dealing with were agencies that were being influenced by major corporations to you know, less in safety regulations, you know, the, the chemical industry's influence on the EPA, pharma's industry, um, a huge amounts of influence on the FDA, for example. But now what we're seeing with the rise of the censorship is this sort of interplay between the corporations and the government. In some places, it's hard to tell who's influencing who. Yeah, there, there's this incredible chart that Matt Taibbi recently put out, um, which we're bringing up here. And um, I wanted to just spend a couple minutes having you help us understand what we're looking at here. So we don't have to go into every circle and every name on it, but you mentioned some of the categories here, government, think tanks, NGOs, fact checkers, academia. So just help us understand what do they all have to do with each other and with mis and disinformation? So I think probably the place to start would be to look back. Um, here's kind of an example. I reported on a, a woman named Claire Wardle who's now at Brown University. She runs a disinformation group there at Brown University. Um, and she kind of started this industry. I mean, I know everyone wants, you know, everyone can bitch and moan about when something started and like, oh no, it actually started like two years prior. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of this stuff really started in 2015 with Claire Wardle. That's where it kind of really started coming together. 
Um, and at the time she was at, I think she was at um, Cornell, I want to say, or NYU. And she was the person who, she kind of really created the, the idea of what disinformation was in 2015. And you know, what's interesting about it is that this all started with funding from Google. And she, with, with this money from Google, she then sort of brought together a bunch of different academic research centers that started to, you know, look into disinformation um, and look into try to categorizing disinformation. I don't think there's really anything wrong with that. I mean, you know, we all know about things that, that are wrong and, and how propaganda operates. Right. Um, the problem is, is that these people are oftentimes determining what terms are without telling us how they created these definitions or where these definitions come from. And what I think is also very interesting is, is when you look at the disinformation researchers out there who call themselves disinformation researchers, they're all aligned with one political party. <laughs> and that party happens to be the Democratic Party. Let's be honest here. I'm not seeing a single person who has strong ties to the Republican Party who you see being noted or put on a pedestal in the New York Times or the Washington Post as a misinformation researcher. We all know which party they're working with, right? right. So that's, I think, is kind of the very you know um, interesting issue here. The other thing that's also, I think, very, and I don't totally understand what's going on here, is whenever you find a misinformation or self-described disinformation researcher, you always discover, right, that they have at some point in time either worked on the issue of vaccines, put out a report about vaccines, um, began attacking people for raising questions about vaccine safety. I have no clue what that's about, um, but I mean, Claire Wardle's an example. This is a person who has zero training in science, zero training in medicine, yet has put herself out as an expert on vaccine disinformation. Mm. Now, and when you look at what they do, you might come away, you might come away with the thought or the idea that, wow, the vaccine industry must really like what they're doing because they seem to be almost acting as a promotional arm of the biopharmaceutical industry. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you just spend some time looking at it and sure enough, like that's what I found out with, you know, Claire Wardle, right? She put out this report um, just right after Trump lost the election to Hillary Clinton, right? And just a few days before Wait, Pfizer came out, I'm sorry. Trump won the election. I'm sorry. After Trump, Trump lost his election to Hillary Clinton. Okay. I'm sorry, after he lost the election, I'm sorry. After he lost the election to Joe Biden, right? Got it. Shortly after that, she puts out this report on vaccine misinformation, right? Claire Wardle does. And how do I know this happened? Because I found it in the Twitter files. She mm. immediately takes it and starts shopping it around internally to Twitter. Right. To let them know that, hey, I've got this new vaccine report out and, you know, you guys should take a look at it. And I had to speed it up because I knew that Pfizer was coming out with their data. Right. Her report lands just like I think the week, same week or a week before Pfizer announced their initial um, vaccine safety data on the COVID vaccine. So we're looking at um, December of 2020. Right. Trump's lost the election. Biden's coming in. Right. And, and we all know what happened is like suddenly everyone was skeptical about the vaccine. And then after Trump lost, everyone embraced the vaccine. Right. Yeah. I mean, very odd that happened. Right. And one of the things that she put out in her report, so I went back looking through it, is she said that one of the, 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 the false vaccine narratives that was being put out was the idea, believe it or not, this was considered a false narrative that there would be vaccine mandates. Now, surprise. Guess what happened? <laughs> there were vaccine mandates. So fact check wrong. There's vaccine mandates coming out. Right. And actually, one of the big um, proponent of vaccines um, who's promoted vaccines all over MSNBC, um, who's, you know, constantly touted as an expert on vaccine misinformation and disinformation is Professor Peter to Hotez in Texas. Correct. He tweeted several times. And guess what he's tweeted several times? as fact check wrong, that there would be vaccine mandates. Guess what happened? Fact check true, vaccine mandates happen. Now, what's also interesting about her report is after her report came out, right? One of the authors on that report, because she left the university where she was at and she went on to Brown and founded a new group and shut down this group she was running at the time called First Draft, 
which is this nonprofit that she was running on vac- on misinformation and disinformation. She was training reporters on it. She would go and give talks. She'd be on NPR. She'd be in news programs about misinformation and disinformation. She worked at the TED Talk to put a program together on vaccine misinformation and disinformation. After she left the university she was at and went to Brown, where she's at right now, one of the report authors um, left first draft because you know it had shut down. And they moved on to join a PR firm called MNC Saatchi, one of the largest PR firms on the planet. Right. He became an analyst there. Now, what is MNC Saatchi? They are a PR firm that it came out from parliamentary hearings in Australia this summer. They were the group working with the Australian government to censor Australians to find out what was vaccine, what was misinformation and disinformation on COVID, right? Um, and another one of the um, a researcher who's named on the report, I looked him up and he joined the UK government in 2021 as a counter disinformation product lead. He was working for the government agency, which it came out this last summer, was involved in censoring Brits, including members of parliament who were making statements about the, co- uh, the government's response. Right. Now, when we look at this chart that Matt ha- Nat put together, you know, and it looks, you know, you see like NGOs, um, you see government agencies, <clears throat> you know, you see nonprofits, right? So we've already talked about a nonprofit first draft that Claire Walter was running. She was at one academic center, went to another, right? One of her report authors then left and joined a PR firm. And then one of the analysts on her report left and joined a government agency, right? So this you can, and then if you go back and look at their LinkedIn accounts, um, one of the analysts or the report authors, he'd been a fact checker in the past. <laughs> it was like, okay, so like he'd been a fact checker in the past. One of the other guys had also, um, I think, worked at um, some nonprofit on misinformation and disinformation. So these people are all just kind of moving around from different jobs. And that's why you need a chart like this to understand what's going on. It's because not only are they integrated in how they work and sort of how they create this idea of misinformation and how they work to shut down people from having thoughts that are labeled misinformation, but also these people are jumping from different aspects of this chart throughout their career because it's it's a career, right? It's it's not that dissimilar where, you know, someone might be a CEO, you know, I mean, might start off, you know, um, working at an academic research center. The next thing you know, they go and work for one of the corporations that, you know, was helping to, you know, to do contracts for that university. And next thing you know, they're at a government agency that works on education. So these people are all moving around within these different groups for jobs. So there's actually an actual industry that has now sprung up around disinformation with job titles and things like that. And it is just mind blowing. Um, but it, it's it's hard to unpack because they are creating disinformation and right. they are also labeling anything that goes against the mainstream narrative as disinformation. Sometimes, um, sometimes they're not even labeling things that go on mainstream disinformation. They're just labeling things for reasons that I can't even understand. Um, there's a story I'm going to be writing pretty soon, which is about there's a study that came out recently looking at um, the effects on dealing with COVID from gargling with salt water. And the study came out and it found that there were positive effects of gargling with salt water. It wasn't huge. Um, I think it, I, I can't remember what the endpoint they looked at in the study. It may have been that it, it lowered your symptoms and caused you not to be as sick as long, or, or maybe it lessened your chance of getting viral infection. The study came out just in early November. And when I went and looked at it on Twitter, I saw someone tweeting like, oh, these fact checkers said this isn't true. And I was like, wait, what? So I go back and look and you trace back to March of 2020, factcheck.org, right? put out a fact check saying there's no evidence that saltwater gargling has any impact on COVID, right? They didn't cite a single study or anything. They just cited some expert they found somewhere that told them no, no impact, right? The New York Times then later had a story that said there's you know, no help of gargling with saltwater. Senator Ron Johnson um, at one point had said that you should use mouthwash, that could, that could help mm-hmm. on dealing with viral infections. He was fact checked wrong. So then I was like, okay, what happened before COVID hit? So I start looking back, 2005, there's an article in the media that says that here's this study that show that gargling with saltwater can lower your likelihood of getting a virus. Guess where it appeared? 
in the New York Times. <laughs> and it it's, referenced this really amazing study, right? Where they actually, it was a good study, right? Because it had three arms. It had people who gargled with salt water the other day, people who used just water and people who did nothing. And people who gargled with salt water, it lowered their likelihood of getting the flu by some tiny 16% or whatever. It lowered the likelihood of how long you would be sick. I think it also lessened your symptoms, right? And then I just looked around. There's other studies kind of showing the same thing. There's a major study in Nature, uh, in the journal Nature, which is the top journal like out there in, in science that looked at the impact of gargling with some of these mouthwashes and found that these what these mouthwashes do is they kill they kill off bacteria and viruses, right? So there's there's there was so what happened with this fact check is right these fact checks made us stupid. We we basically learned we knew something from science. Then a fact check came along in COVID and we unlearned this stuff. And we're now at a point where we're relearning the things that we knew many years ago that were reported back in 2005 in the New York Times. So we've gone through this whole thing in which we're learning and then unlearning things because of the fact checkers. Yeah. And and you're made to feel like a criminal for having the wrong thoughts. Like, oh, well, you, you know, how crazy that you would think that mouthwash would Well, it's, it's not just for having the wrong thoughts. It's Sometimes your thoughts are actually right. I mean, sometimes what you what you are saying is total nonsense, but sometimes what you're saying is right. The whole thing is is not not to actually just make you feel bad. It's first to label you, mm -hmm. right, and then to disseminate the label to say, "Aha, we've determined this person's a nutter," and um, now um, now we're going to let everyone know that they're a nutter. Right. You know. Right. Um, another peg in this kind of revolving wheel and it's not actually i think a category on this chart but you mentioned it it's these huge global pr agencies and yes. and the, um the power that they wield um you did a deep dive a couple years ago and discovered how powerful at least one of these agencies is weber shanwick and um and how much they are involved in what we see in here about vaccines so talk about that I mean, I'll tell you, like when this whole disinformation industry first started, like, you know, coming out, I thought it was all PR firms. You know, if you go back and look historically, um, you know, most of the propaganda that's been put out um, in America or by the American government was done through major PR firms. Like, if, again, if you trace all the way back to the 1950s, who told us that, you know, tobacco might or might not be dangerous starting back in the 1950s when scientific evidence built up? It was Hill and Knowlton, and they ran this campaign for 50 years. All the other PR firms, like, eventually worked for Tobacco too. Edelman, you name it, they all worked for you know Tobacco at one point in time. They all picked up and moved on to work for all these other industries. You know, at other times, telling you, you know, do you really know that McDonald's is bad for you? Like, what's your evidence? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. maybe French fries, like, actually, you know, can be a part of a you know a, a well balanced meal. You know, yeah. they've all worked for these, you know, different corporations to tell you that everything's, you know, that you're a nutter and, you know, corporations are right. So I thought that's what was really going on at the time. I just didn't realize and we didn't we didn't really know until the Twitter files came out like that this involved all these other, you know, groups working together and that in many ways it wasn't, you know, PR firms are kind of in the background. So we know that like MNC Saatchi, for instance, has been, you know, behind the scenes, you know, working on this stuff. It, they had a contract with the Australian federal, federal government to, you know, help label Australians, you know, as fact check wrong. Um, but the one that 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 I exposed that, you know, was involved in, you know, putting together propaganda, at least for the vaccine industry, although I think as far as I'm concerned, the biopharmaceutical industry is the most powerful um, group actually in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but what had happened is I was one night sitting at my computer and I ran across this story that a PR firm named Weber Shandwick had a contract with the CDC. And I was like, wow, they got a contract with the CDC. Like, what are they doing? And I looked and I found out that they were working for the vaccine center at the CDC, right. <clears throat> the group that, that, that explains to Americans what the facts are on, are on vaccines. They also help to run this group called ASIP, which I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but they're the group that, you know, brings scientists together to make determinations about whether a certain vaccine should be recommended for certain people or for certain age groups or whatever. Um, and we were Shandrick was running that that area, too. Um, I went looking through the LinkedIn accounts and, and one um, 
person who's working there describe themselves as being embedded at the CDC vaccine yeah. center. <laughs> so they're, an, they're a Weber Shamwick employee, but right. they're embedded at the CDC. So they have a job title that makes them look like they work for a government agency. Right. This is crazy. It's a crazy. Yeah, and so my next thought was, okay, wait, who else are their clients? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is me literally like my wife's asleep and I'm in bed sitting next to her with my laptop, you know, 11 o'clock at night, just like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> and then 4.30 in the morning, I shut my computer down. I'd saved all the links, made screenshots and everything and found out that surprise, surprise, they also worked for Pfizer. They also worked for Moderna. Yes. <laughs> the two major vaccines that were being, you know, pushed on Americans at the time. Um, they, now they also was, work for the Gates Foundation and the WHO oh, yeah. and UNICEF. I, yeah, I have, I, I'm sure like they are the large, I, they, I think they're the first or the second largest PR firm on the planet. Yeah. Um, they were actually involved in a scandal with um, one drug about like back in 2000, they were helping to ghostwrite studies. Um, so when this pharma company was promoting their product, um, what was happening, Weber Shandwick employees were writing the studies for them. So they take the data from the company, they then write the studies up and then they give that manuscript to a doctor to look at, make some little changes, edit it and shove it out the door. And that was exposed again through a lawsuit. That's how we always learn these things, mm -hmm. right? It's mostly through lawsuits. It's not because some physician or some academic somewhere figures it out. You know, I mean, they may figure it out, be the first person to figure it out and go public about it. But what you always find is that behind the scenes, the corporations knew way more than any of us on the outside has ever known because they were the ones selling the product. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So, you know, and when I went to the CDC and asked them to comment on this, <laughs> They didn't want to comment on it. Now, what's also interesting is um, the the main um, physician group that licenses physicians, um, they've been very big in the disinformation space in combating disinformation. Is the which ABIM? I thought, I'm sorry? The ABIM? Yeah, the American Board of Internal Medicine. Got it. Yeah. Um, they've been very big on this issue on addressing misinformation, which I thought was funny because having worked on a lot of drug scandals, I'm like, huh. Um, did you guys like remove the license of anyone who's involved in promoting Vioxx? Because yeah. <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah. Did you guys like go after the license for anyone who promoted Avandia when Avandia was killing Americans? And while this COVID pandemic was happening, there was also an opioid pandemic happening. And it was happening because all these doctors were being paid off by Purdue right. to promote opioids. Have you gone after the license for any physician in the United States for promoting opioids and killing all these Americans? Yeah. No, but they are very concerned about physicians who make comments about the COVID vaccine. Yeah. So they're going after the licenses of physicians who say negative, make negative comments about the COVID vaccines and take a wild guess who the president of the American Board of, of, of um, Internal Medicine is working hand in glove with to promote the idea of disinformation, Weber Shandwick, <laughs> <laughs> the PR firm for the vaccine companies. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's absolutely nuts. Um, I I have so many more questions. I I want to say one one thing. You know about the lawsuits. Um, there's a there's a lawsuit on right now, after et al. against the FDA, which could potentially, if it moves forward, also reveal what was happening around the whole kind of horse paste gate, if you remember that from a couple of years ago. Um, and obviously with what you've just added, which is that there were Weber Shanwick people embedded at the CDC working on this, um, you know, disinformation and anything, even, you know, you can't talk about mouthwash. Well, you certainly can't talk about any repurposed drug that may be effective to prevent or treat COVID. Right. Um, Hopefully, if this lawsuit kind of makes its way through the courts, there'll be a little bit of discovery that uh, that shows what was behind that. Um, but I wanted well, to just I mean, kind one, of, one go of the ahead. things you should know is that, you know, the 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 the, the, the sort of um, program that was put in place under the Trump administration to bring the vaccines and, and get them to market was called Operation Warp Speed. Mm -hmm. And there were two people that led that. One was a um, member of the military. I'm blanking on his name. I think he's a lieutenant general. <clears throat> and the other one was a pharmaceutical executive named Monsef Sliawi, whose name I can remember because, you, don't, you know, there's not that many, you know, people that in prominent in biomedicine 
with, uh, you know, Arabic or North African names, right? So that mm -hmm. once I heard that name, you know, I, I kind of remembered it. Now, who is Monsef Sliawi? Well, if you go back and look, <laughs> Monsef Sliawi was head of research at GlaxoSmithKline in 2009 when it came out that Avandia was killing people. Mm -hmm. And when I was working in the Senate, I caught through records that we got from GSK, Monsef Sliawi lied to Congress about the dangers of Avandia. <clears throat> and when we put out the report on this and it appeared in the New York Times, a friend of mine at the Wall Street Journal called me and told me that Glaxo was terrified to have Monsef come back to the United States. They were keeping him in Europe because um, so he couldn't be subpoenaed for lying to Congress. Um, but, you know, so he sort of disappeared. And then I wake up one day and I'm reading the New York Times about this new Operation Warp Speed. I'm like, oh, my God, Monsef. <laughs> So I wrote about that for Daily Beast, you know, um, my, you know, Monsef lied to Congress. He's, you know, I mean, it's just you keep recycling some of these same characters and even when they get caught lying like this, they just kind of like go underground for a little bit and then they come and pop back up. Yeah, no, it's it's insane. Um, you talked a little bit already about um, how the academic journals, at least in in one way, have been corrupted. You talked about ghost right. writing, but there's so many other ways. But you have right. your own personal experience with having worked at a journal and seeing how the industry has influence over what gets published, right? Right. Right. So I was many years ago, I was at a journal called Environmental Science and Technology, um, <clears throat> which is the top journal in environmental science. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know, unless you're a scientist, you, this wouldn't make any sense to you. But I used to always say that everyone publishing in, in ESNT thought they had a science or nature paper, which are the two top journals in the world, mm -hmm. but they really just had like a paper for ESNT. And so it's a lot of it's very wonky stuff, like, you know, ground pollution issues, air pollution issues. I remember one thing that was very interesting was looking at, um, you know, I'll give an example. Uh, well, I'll give you an example, like the most famous paper that um, I think that came out while I was there. Um, back during Hurricane Katrina, um, you would see, you look on CNN and you'd see all these, you know, poor black people in New Orleans wading through this water. Um, and, and I remember on CNN, they were calling it, they were calling it gumbo, you know, that it had all this stuff in the water and no one knew how dangerous it was. Yeah. And there was a professor at LSU who came down quickly and sampled the water, did some really quick, you know, looks at it and found out it's just, it wasn't really all that dangerous to be wading through it. Um, it, 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 it was environmentally dangerous. It was about as dangerous as regular stormwater um, with the amount of chemicals that were in it. Um, the problem was the danger to the lake nearby because it wasn't just like, you know, a half an inch of stormwater runoff. It was like nine, 10 feet, you know, so it got like that lake got, you know, what, you know, would be pollution of, you know, one stormwater event. It got like, you know, three years of that, like all at once, you know. Um, so it has some very wonky stuff. And while I was there, I wrote a piece about a group called the Weinberg Group, which is a science for hire group that um, they basically create research um, for industries. And they were they had sent a letter to DuPont that popped up, came out, came public in a lawsuit. Um, and they had outlined to DuPont all these things they would do, how they would create research to say that this chemical called PFOA wasn't dangerous. They actually even suggested that they would um, create a study to show that it actually might be good for you. <laughs> might be good no. for you. I, was, <laughs> I was like, wow. And then I looked them up and they, of course, had done, you know, work for the tobacco industry um, in the past. Uh, some of this stuff came out. There was a um, there was a, 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 a movie called, I think, Dark Waters. Dark Waters. Yeah. With Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. That was the whole thing that the lawyer that was all about was the lawyer who found that and ended up you know, making sure it got out and, you know, got into my hands. Um, so I've kind of been following this area for quite some time about, you know, corruption and research. So, um, and I mean, depending upon the issue involved, you know, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of corruption and things that are called science or things that are called, you know, medicine. I make, I make fun of this thing, you know, like, you know, follow the science. I'm like, oh, follow the science. <laughs> yeah. And it's been going on for, as you said, I mean, at least 60 years from from big tobacco on, but probably before that right. also. So why um, don't we, why aren't we smarter about it? Why don't we know more about what we're being told? 
there's this paper that came out in March of 2020 um, that ran in this journal called Nature Medicine, which is a pretty high profile journal. And the whole the paper argued that it was, you know, it was implausible that, you know, the pandemic could have started from a lab in Wuhan, China. And we've just now the last we've known for quite some time, but the last few months become very clear that that paper was completely orchestrated by um, Anthony Fauci at the NIH and Jeremy Farrar at the Wellcome Trust, which was one of the largest funders of um, uh, virology research on the planet. <clears throat> they totally orchestrated that paper behind the scenes and planted it in the journal that they then turned around and pointed to Anthony Fauci during a White House press conference, actually, um, to say, aha, you know, we've got this independent evidence that the pandemic couldn't have started in the lab. Um, <clears throat> and there's a scientist tweeted out that like that paper was, he's never seen corruption like that in his life. And I was just like, wait, okay, hold my beer. Like, <laughs> let's go into some detail about what's really gone on here, guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, so you get a lot of these scientists who are just kind of like, wow, I didn't, I didn't know these things. You know, I, I didn't know that things could happen like this. And I, I talked to another scientist and I said, he came across to me like, you know, I mean, like, uh, um, it came across you like some, like, you know, Barney, uh, what was his name? Barney Fyatt. What was the name of that? The guy in uh, the- um, Andy Griffith? Andy Griffith, yeah. He came I think across- it was Barney Fife, like, yeah. Yeah, he came across me like Barry, Barry Fife, like, you know, police officer Mayberry, like, I didn't realize police, like, did violence against minorities. Like, whoever knew that, you know? I was like, hello, <laughs> you know, I have access to a newspaper? You know, I mean, did you not read about what was going on with the opioid pandemic and what the Sacklers did? You know, yeah. so a lot of a lot of these scientists, they just they don't want to believe, you know, how much corruption there is going on. And it's not to their it's to their detriment to point out when there is, you know, corrupt actors in their own field. So I think that's part of it also. But the other thing is that we still have this idea that like science is science. It's almost like it's like we're like, you know still in the 1800s living in Ireland. And we believe that like, you know, the priest would never molest little boys, you know? Yeah. I mean, so that's kind of what's going on right now. There's there's a little bit of a deer in the headlights effect with a lot of these scientists. Um, and I, I just, honestly, I don't have a lot of um, patience for much of it. Yeah. Um, it is shocking. I mean, if you look at um, a lot of the doctors who have started to speak out during COVID about some of the things they're seeing up until recently, they read JAMA, The Lancet, British Medical Journal. They read them and believed them. They read the New York Times every day. Um, it took this COVID pandemic for them to say, wait, all the things <coughs> that I know are true, are I'm now being told are not true, there's something wrong. But it, it took up until the 21st century for a lot of them to, to get that, which is just amazing. Um, and then, so I wanted to just kind of bring that to this amazing investigation that you did that was commissioned by the British Medical Journal and externally peer reviewed. Um, it was about Brooke Jackson, the whistleblower, and then it, and it was published and then tell us what happened. So what happened is I got contacted by the BMJ to do this um, investigation. And I, I'd heard some rumors that there was something going on there was some whistleblower and I didn't really know um, what was going on, but they commissioned me to write it. I've run, a, I've written quite a few like investigations while I was in the Senate. And um, so I got contacted um, to write the piece and I, you know, they started sending me all these documents and secret recordings that Brooke had done um, documents. She creates screenshots um of stuff and i just kind of started going you know going through it and i remember at the time i i i, I told my wife because i know how these things work and i was like i'm gonna go into a pit for like two weeks i've just got a lot of stuff i got to go through and you know make sure all this stuff is right <clears throat> my wife asked me she's like um well which vaccine is about and i was like it was um the pfizer one and she's like that's the one we got and i was like oh shit, <laughs> I've totally forgotten I totally forgotten that like that was the one we got and like it wasn't that like we had a choice it was just that, like you know the way Europe Europe worked is they were buying vaccines and Pfizer was the one they got so like you know and I just you know my wife's a doctor and I'm a man so you listen to your wife like most <laughs> men do for medical advice 
You do what your wife tells you to do, right? I mean, most doctors know that you want to, you want this guy to take his heart medication, call his wife up and tell him he's got to do it, you know, and then he'll listen. And plus your wife's a doctor, so it makes everything easy. It's like, what do I do? So, you know, I started going through the documents, um, spent a lot of time putting together a timeline and listening to everything. And after like, oh, I'm sorry, I got this bed. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I started going through all the documents and everything and then uh, putting together a timeline of what happened. And after I'd done that for quite some time, I started talking to Brooke. I'm like, okay, hey, what's your story? You know, what's going on? Who are these people? Um, what's your background? You know, spent quite a few days talking to her. And what and, had she uncovered? Well, what she had was, you know, she's someone who'd worked in the clinical trial area for quite some number of years and got pulled in to help run clinical trials on the COVID vaccine um, for Pfizer. And as soon as she got there, she realized the place was just chaos. The the, the group running it, like they, don't, they didn't really know what they were doing. Um, one of the things you have to understand is that you can create one of these clinical research sites, a company to get clinical, you know, grants. You just got to find a doctor to sign off on all this stuff and get contracts. It's really that easy. I mean, you could start a company today. If you had a physician who would say, I would be the person in charge of this stuff. And you had a friend at a pharmaceutical company um, that felt that, you know, you would be able to get patients enrolled and you would run the company properly. You could get a contract. It's not, there's not some special, you know, process to doing all this stuff. It's running a company, you know? Um, and she realized that there was just huge problems with how the clinical trial was being run. Um, and when she started bringing these issues up to her superiors, they didn't want to hear it. And she eventually realized that, uh, her, but her job was to make sure things were being run properly. Yeah. But when she brought up the fact that things were being run properly, they started to pivot and focus on her. And so she got scared. And so she started documenting things. She started taking screenshots uh, with her phone. And, you know, the one thing that that really shocked me, the thing that was really um, the most interesting to me was when um, she had been brought into a room. She was being brought into, she was being counseled for basically being a bad employee for pointing out that things were bad. Right. Um, and so she was brought into this room and you could actually on the, on the, and she just turned her phone on. They didn't realize that she was recording all this stuff. And you, she was crying at the time. She's like, why am I being like, what's going on with me? I'm just trying to explain to you guys stuff. Is not working? Right. And one of her bosses said, <laughs> he said, look, we know there's problems. We know things aren't going to run. We know it's a cleanup on aisle five. He just, oh so he God. described the clinical trial as a cleanup on aisle five. Oh my now, they knew that they just, I mean, they weren't, they, they, they were just trying to rush this stuff out. They had people who really didn't have any training that were working in the laboratory. Um, things were being unblinded. Um, we didn't have this at the time, but I put out later, you know, they were totally panicking inside the company. They're going to get an FDA inspection. Mm. Um, and they were emails like, we know what's going to happen. We know the FDA is coming. Um, and so she once she realized that they weren't going to listen to her and that you know she was getting worried about what was going on with this clinical trial she contacted the fda the fda has a group inside of them called the office of criminal investigation oci they were formed back in i want to say the 80s or the 90s in response to a scandal at the fda called the generic drug scandal what happened there is it came out that fda employees were taking bribes from generic drug companies. And once this was uncovered, um, Congress um, basically said the FDA needs their own police force. And the FDA now has, um, Office of Criminal Investigation has about 187, 160, 180 um, uh, federal police agents that work on corruption um, in the pharmaceutical industry. What's interesting about it is um, the woman who actually ran OCI, <laughs> Brooke had an original lawsuit and one of the people they contacted there was a woman who ran the office of criminal investigation who looked at everything and said, this is terrible. The FDA is complicit in all of this. Wow. The woman who ran the FDA's office of criminal investigation said this, right? <clears throat> so, you know, one of the things that we did is um, normally in journalism, what you do is you contact a company before you put out a story 
Hmm. We were concerned that what they would do is they would run to the courts and get an injunction to halt the story. So what we did is we had it peer reviewed so that it come out as a peer reviewed product, um, which would then provide legal protections from having to what's called right, you know, first, first, you know, uh, the right to respond. So we did it that way legally. I, I don't tell you, I'm not a British lawyer, you know, I mean, I don't understand all these things. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, what was funny is the night before the article was going to come out, um, you know, and everything was lawyered up and peer reviewed by these experts who've looked at clinical trials for a long time. I called a friend of mine who I'd worked with in the Senate, who's now at a big law firm, you know, in what's called downtown, which means on K Street. Mm -hmm. I called her up and we're talking. I was like, I'm not going to say her name. She's a partner at a big law firm and she reps pharma companies. So I started going through everything I had and she, we'd worked together on investigations in the Senate. Um, she's a former, um, actually, U.S. attorney who's um, a, uh, assistant U.S. attorneys um, prosecuted um, health care fraud. Mm -hmm. um, and we started going through it all. And I was like, what do you think they're going to do? And she's like, well, blah, blah, like, what do you have? And I started going through it all. And like, she's like, what? And we, we were talking for like 10 minutes. And I was just like, oh, Paul, you know what they're going to do. They're going to fucking panic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what she said, what they probably happen is as soon as the article hits, the general counsel at Pfizer would like send out an immediate alert, get everyone on a Zoom call, right? Because this is during the pandemic, you know, and be like, okay, what was this contract? What happened with the clinical trial? We need to get someone immediately over to the White House. We need to get someone over at the FBI healthcare fraud task force, someone immediately over the, over, over at the FDA. We need to get someone over at Senate Finance Committee, like all the committees that have to hit. You know, it was very obvious, like, you know, having worked, I know like what was going to happen. Like yeah. you just go out and you assure everyone like, hey, I just want you to know this is all nonsense, you know, blah, 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 blah. What's hilarious is because it's involved um, Pfizer's vaccine, you know, and there's multiple vaccines are out there. You know, I had disclosed that I took Pfizer's vaccine because, you know, there's multiple vaccines involved. So it's disclosed at the bottom that I was double vaccinated with Pfizer's vaccine. I was still called an anti-vaxxer on Twitter. <laughs> and like, it doesn't matter what you've done. I mean, you could be the CEO of Pfizer and like someone's going to call you an anti-vaxxer. Like, that label just get like that label is just everyone, you know, that's why that's why I say vaccines are magic. Like it doesn't matter like what the evidence is like. It's not true. Vaccines are science. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So the article comes out, you know, I'm I'm told I'm an anti-vaxxer. And then one of Facebook's um, <laughs> one of the Facebook fact checkers <laughs> came out. Fact check wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Fact check wrong. Um, lacks context. <laughs> lacks context. I was, like, what? I was like, what the hell does this mean? <laughs> you know, my editor at the BMJ is like, Paul, what do you think about this? Like, and, and people couldn't share it on Facebook anymore. Hmm. And I was like, and the first line of it says, did Facebook's blog find that, or did BMJ's blog find that? Like, this wasn't even a blog. I'm, not, I, I'm working on things. I don't have time to deal with this crap. You know, these damn fact checkers, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't have time to sit there and like deal with every piece of garbage that appears on social media. You know, I'm working on things. I'm a professional. I have time to deal with like some rando idiot in the audience screaming, you know? So my editor, um, the editors at the BMJ sent this letter to Mark Zuckerberg about their stupid fact check, um, you know, that was completely unprofessional, lacked any evidence. It was total nonsense. Mm -hmm. This, this fact checker is called um, leadstories.com. They have done so many stupid fact checks. Like over, they're one of the worst. I think, I really do think they're one of the worst. Like they've done just nutty, nutty things. And it's always, I actually, I did a story one time on on the fact checkers. And I asked one of the fact checkers out, out there. I was like, have you ever done a fact check on any of the pharma companies? Yeah. <laughs> they never have. You know, the BBC's, you know, fact checker, when I, I emailed her about it, I'm like, have you ever fact checked the pharma companies? She's like, uh, I'm working on it. She's still working on it. That was like a year and a half ago. <laughs> so you know, did, the, mean, did the BMJ stand behind the piece or, oh, yeah, you know? Of course. Yeah. No, I mean, we had like, I mean, everything had been lawyered up, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and and the thing you have to understand is, is that like, I'm not some idiot reporter. Like I've worked in the Senate. I've run, in, I've run investigations, right? Right. I mean, I've 
been in the room with the lawyers working for the pharma companies. It's like why I called up to talk to my friend who's like left to go work at one of the big law firms downtown because we've both been in the room with these lawyers, yeah. you know, yeah. we know like, you know, what to look for and how to write things carefully and how not to you know get anything wrong. You know, Pfizer didn't find a single error in the story because they would have found an error. They would have sent a letter to the BMJ and threatened them. Yeah, They didn't do yeah. that. What they did is they relied on their fact checker to say, aha, Back check wrong, yeah. lacks context. It's like, yeah. doesn't mean anything. It's, you know? it's such an amazing example of this whole disinformation industrial complex. Like it, it, it's an externally peer reviewed investigation in one of the top medical journals showing that the vaccines that are being rolled out around the world have issues that should be looked at. That's all you're trying to say is there's, right. there's issues here shouldn't we be looking at this? And instead of blowing up and making front page news every day, nothing really. Yeah, there know? was there was nothing in America about this. I mean, it's pretty obvious that, you know, <clears throat> the American, um, I mean, the science writers, I like to say, they report for not on science. I mean, their job is to basically promote science. Um, so I wasn't shocked by that. You know, there was quite a bit of reporting actually on the issue in the foreign media. Um, to me, the thing looking back on this, um, the, the troubling issue to me was the fact that the FDA had a whistleblower contact them about problems in this clinical trial, you know, and they never even went and investigated. Yeah. You know, we, we looked to see like what 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 groups they'd investigated because it's reported. They never looked at Ventavia. Yeah. Um, Ventavia went on to get more contracts from Pfizer. Pfizer didn't care. Um, Ventavia actually tried to say that like Brooke Jackson had never actually worked on that clinical trial. <laughs> we, we actually, yeah. we had, we had the documents where they sent to Pfizer saying she's working on the clinical trial. She needs to be let into the computer system. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there, I mean, I, I wasn't trying, I mean, I was, just, I was, I was talking to Brooklyn. I was like, Brooke, you gotta understand Pfizer's smart. They're not going to say anything and sort of fight. They want this to go away. Ventavia is some stupid company in Dallas, Texas, you know, by a couple of local yokels. They're going to try to say like, well, this isn't true, you know, not knowing that like, well, we have, like we're just going to make the documents public and show that you don't know what you're talking about, you know? Yeah. So, you know, the whole thing is just ridiculous. But to me, the main thing looking back on it, and it's still scary to this day, is that when I went to the FDA and asked them for comment, they just said the vaccine is safe. And I was like, but how do you know? Yeah. I mean, how do you know? Yeah. I mean, if 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 you found out, right, that you know, your local store that someone came out of there, you know, with emails and pictures and everything showing that, you know, the store was putting, you know, um um bad meat out for sale. I mean, would you go shop there? You know, and like the pictures appear and there's secret recordings with the people talking about the fact like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. It's expired. Put it out there anywhere. They'll buy it. Would you go shopping there? Yeah. You know, and then how about if you found out that the person was so frustrated by the fact that the store wouldn't do anything, that they went to the local health authorities with this information, the local health authority never investigated. Wouldn't you be scared about going out to eat? You yeah. know, I mean, these are just basic issues that, you know, and the government just fell apart. Yeah. And instead of doing their job and investigating that um, whistleblower complaint, it seems like the government is more interested in putting all their resources on guarding the public against the dangers of disinformation instead of the dangers of potentially a harmful vaccine. It just, right. it, it doesn't make any sense. So- Well, what's so interesting is that, you know, I mean, when you see that there's no, you know, fact check wrong about, you know, these these pharma companies. I mean, what was happening simultaneously during the COVID COVID you know, pandemic, the opioid pandemic, yeah. right? I mean, the, the opioid pandemic was going on, a which was caused by a pharmaceutical company lying to everyone about the dangers of opioids. Not just that, but if you look back historically, the industry that has paid the most in federal fines, right, for putting out crappy products and lying about them. Is pharma yeah. the only time that, it, that 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 there was a bigger fine in the history of America 
was the Gulf oil spill with BP, in which they had they got a huge enormous fine for what happened there. But if you other other than that, you know, it's been Pfizer, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, you know, you just name them over and over again. It's all these pharma companies, Purdue Pharma. Yeah. You know, they're right now like for the Supreme Court on their settlement for lying about the dangerous opioids. That's in the New York Times just yesterday. But for some reason, when they're these co same companies. I used to say, like, just if you're going to put out a product, just call it a vaccine. I was like, OK, like I want to I want to like put out a car that I just like build together and I'll just call it vaccine, you know, and then like suddenly, hey, it's fine. It's a vaccine, you know, I mean, so apparently if you just take a product, you know, same company and you call it a vaccine, you know, none of the rules apply anymore. Yeah, no, it's nuts. Um, it's it sort of strikes at the heart of. Um, journalism today and you know you're you're out there fighting the good fight doing investigative journalism as it should be but there are not enough of you doing this and instead there are people doing fact check jobs who think that they're doing journalism so um yeah i just i, I don't know i i hate to call myself a journalist um it just seems like the wrong label for for the moment but do you think there's hope? Do you think that there have you met people who are doing the right thing or taking journalism in a, in a better direction? I mean, I can tell you from I, I, I know from friends at like the big media outlets that like, you know, they, they know that this, this, what's going on is 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 terrible. You know, I mean, um, I can tell you right now that there were on, I don't want to talk about which story it is and tie it back, but you know, there's, there's a, there's three big newspapers in America. And I talked to one of the reporters at one of those papers just like six weeks ago. And we we're talking about how there was one particular topic that this person who's a Pulitzer prize winning investigative reporter, you know, I mean, you have to understand that like there's, there's, there's categories of even the top rewards, right? So there's a guy named Ed Young, at the Atlantic, yeah. who won an, a Pulitzer for his um, um, his reporting, right, on the COVID pandemic. But if you look at the category, it's for features writing, right? <laughs> like I write purdy stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Ed Young could investigate. Ed Young couldn't find his ass in the dark with two hands and a flashlight. <laughs> now, that's not who Ed Young is. Ed's like, let me tell you how the science is very cool, you know. Right. This reporter is the totally opposite, right? This is a person who has um, a Pulitzer for investigative reporting is working, was working with another reporter also at the same outlet, um, who's an investigative reporter and has worked in a, a lot of different topics. They had sto COVID stories shut down twice, you know, in which these things were shut down. Eventually a story came out, you know, and the reporter actually was telling me about how much they hate this other reporter who's like probably a good friend of Ed Young's <laughs> and how this person spends her whole time, you know, kissing Anthony Fauci's ass, you know, same media outlet. So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's tough. It's always been that way. Yeah. Um, these doing this type of, you know, work, you know, is, is always, you know, difficult, if not impossible. Um, you know, and there's just stories and stories over and over again about that. And I, I don't know what the solution is. I, what I tell people is that you need to read widely, you know? Yes. I think in terms of from the the media consumption perspective, um, it's about reading kind of everything out there and then making your own determination about, I think one thing that you just said, I think it's really important is kind of knowing who these reporters are, actually reading the right. byline and seeing right. what other things that they've written and um, even, you know, watching an interview that they've done and really understanding their perspective, which is a lot of work for someone who's just yeah, trying to no, write the news. That's but, the problem. Yeah, I had a friend who was giving a talk at, at um, one of the East Coast Ivy League schools, and um, he called me up and we were talking about it was supposed to be he's like, he's like this big thing they was talking about called misinformation and we're giggling about it. Right. And and I said, well, the, the only thing I can tell you is that, you know, there's two things you want to look for. First, what what outlets this person publishing in, because some are more credible than others. And second one who's the reporting, because you know, and I, me and this person, like, look, we all know people, the New York Times who suck. We both know people like that. And we both know people who are like at some crappy outlet who are really good, you know? So you can't just go immediately with, you know, one or the other. You really need to look at kind of like almost know the history of, you know, this person and, you know, what they've kind of done. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I think the other thing um, that you just sort of hit on a little bit is that there's a lot of 
internal gatekeeping. So, um, you know, you said you had the this friend that you were talking to as an investigative journalist who had stories shut down. So I'm assuming that means that the editor, when they heard the pitch, said, nope, we're not doing that. And there's been more. No, actually, no, actually the, the, the stories were spiked. They were actually reported out. I'm sorry. Yeah, they were actually reported out. And then they somewhere up the food chain, you know, editor above the editor, you know, mm -hmm. spiked it. You know, that's called a story being spiked. So these were right. these were stories that were reported out. They got the green and, light and then just never yeah, made the light of day. They just never made the light of day. And I knew this because me and this reporter, we've got similar sources and it came up in a conversation with one of the source mm. and they said, yeah, these, you know, I know these stories have been, they've been having a hard time getting these stories out. They've been shut down twice. Right. Um, and, so. and there, there have been other journalists who have said, you know, they had a really good rapport mm. with certain editors and lots of their stories used to get accepted. And then all of a sudden when they said, look, I want to look at this angle of COVID or this angle of the vaccine rollout, the the same editors will come back and say nope we're not doing that we're not talking right. about those stories and actually you should kind of watch your your uh, career because if you keep pitching stories like this you might have trouble so there there is right. this kind of self censorship that's happening amongst journalists who should be out there pounding the pavement and doing the reporting and and they're not I remember there was a story in the Atlantic about um, a doctor in Europe who had um, a, an aggressive form of cancer that came up and he himself made a link to his own booster. And right. in the course of the reporting, the journalist said she thought about whether or not she wanted to report this story because she right. didn't want to encourage vaccine hesitancy. Yeah, right. I remember that. Yeah. Oh, no, I know that reporter. Yeah, she's terrible. She's terrible. <laughs> I made fun of her on Twitter, actually. I'm blanking on her name right now. She's Canadian. Yeah, I don't remember um, her name either. But it's just, it, it's it's amazing that she actually said that because you, you know, you would no, think. No, no, I'll tell you why she did that. She said that as a sort of a signal to her friends, like, hey, I want to let you know, I'm still good. I'm still part of your little science writing. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Yeah, that's why she said that. That's why that whole thing was done. Oh, I followed her for a long time. Yeah, no, I, she's, she's awful. Um, and that admission, I was just like, oh, this is like, I, I just, I stepped a little bit outside the boundaries of acceptable science writing behavior, but I'm still part of our little tribe. I just want you guys know. Yeah, no, the whole thing's ridiculous. Yeah. So is there an alternative in independent media? Um, because it seems like independent media is also not free of bias. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, to me. I mean, I'll just tell you like what I used to do when I was young, you know, when I was in college, what I used to do is I would read the paper and then I would read like things on the right and the left. So I would read like, you know, on the right, I mean, on the left, I might read like, um, you know, the nation and, and new Republic. And then on the right, I might read like national review. And there was, I'm blanking on the name of this, um, like on a name of there's this there's this there's this conservative Jewish magazine I used to read all the time. Uh, the tablet? Um, uh, huh? The tablet? No, no, no. This no the tablet's new. I'm talking about this okay. is a, this is back, back in the day. Back, I'm blanking. I'm blanking on the name of it right now. Um, but I used to I used to read them all the time, you know. And so to get like because you know you you get like different perspectives and maybe slight spins, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the same kind of issue. But I think what's going on right now is that's just there's no spinning anymore. There's just a focus on just like these are the facts and like just totally cleave off any idea that there's any shared facts at all and just putting out not I mean the greatest example I can see of this is there's one of the big disinformation groups out there is is called the Center for Countering Digital Hate. You know, that is a nonprofit that was started in 2018 when you go back and look through the records by um, employees of the conservative wing of the labor British Labor Party. Um, and what they were designed to do is they were designed to go after the left within the Labor Party and just target them as hateful. And they were successful. They helped to drive out um, Jeremy Corbyn, who was a lefty leader of the Labor Party. They tanked this um, website called The Canary, which was a leftist um, website. And then they bounced into the United States. The guy who was running them is a guy named Imran Ahmed. Uh, who's a um, was a British Labour Party political operative working for members of parliament. And since they've landed in the United States, their targets have switched to becoming Twitter 
And, you know, John F. Kennedy Jr., who's like <laughs> a major threat to Biden. Surprise, surprise. Robert you know, F. Kennedy and, Jr. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they don't they don't disclose their um, they don't disclose their funding. But I found that about 75 percent of it comes like some big bolus that came through this one um, Charles Schwab investment fund that landed in their bank. And on their board is a woman named Aline Kashishian who um, is a talent agent in, um, in LA for actors. One of her, one of her, one of her um, clients is the actor, Mark Ruffalo. Right. Now, guess who's online right now promoting Imran Ahmed in the Center for Counting Digital Hate? Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> you know? The same actor oh. who played the lawyer who uncovered yeah. Yeah. the, <laughs> the And so how do we know that like, they're basically working directly for the Democratic Party? Well, mm -hmm. the, the board, of the Center for Counter Digital Hate is a guy named Simon Clark, who comes out of the Center for American Progress, which you might remember, that was the group that was founded by John Podesta, who was the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Mm -hmm. So put it together. Yeah. It's um, quite frankly, pretty overwhelming once you start digging and going down these rabbit holes. And I mean, you do this for a living you're very good at it. You've been doing it for a long time. So you probably have a thicker skin than a lot of people who are just waking up and starting to see all the different layers. So yeah. uh, any advice for, for people um, on how to just deal with not becoming overwhelmed and wanting to turn away from it? I mean, I think you just have to, I mean, a lot of this stuff is really kind of I did not realize like the extent of what this stuff was that was going on. Like I had no clue, you know, I honestly, I'll tell you, I thought, this, this all smelled like PR firms. You know, I didn't know that there was all this. And I could see that there were these charlatans in academia who were like, I'm an expert on disinformation. What, what does that mean? How? how? And how come like your labels always go in one direction? That's weird. You know, I mean, like I say, it, it, I mean, I think most people realize that like, you know, when you look at one specific aspect of this, you know, like these fact checkers are full of garbage or like, you know, why is it this academic like, her politics just happened to align with the Democratic Party. Like everything just happens to fall like in place for Biden administration policies and the biopharmaceutical industry. Like, how did that happen? Who'd ever thunk that like we should like, you know, look to the biopharmaceutical industry for truth? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy when you think about it, right? So I think I think in isolation, people kind of know that some of this stuff doesn't look good, but they don't really have like put the parts together, yeah. you know, and how the the parts work, you know, and part of what you can tell is, you know, how, you know, how concerted some of this stuff is, is you just look to see what's happening with Elon Musk, you know, I mean, since he bought Twitter and took away, you know, the liberal squeaky toy, I mean, they've been furious at him. They're yeah. coming at him left and right. I mean, Bob Iger, you know, Disney CEO is definitely upset with, you know, Elon Musk. What they don't tell you though is, Guess who Bob Iger is donating to for the election campaign? Yeah. Joe Biden. Guess who, you know, uh, uh, Bob Iger wanted to be ambassador for and work for his administration. You know, he wanted to work for Joe Biden to be ambassador to China, you know. So all this stuff is kind of sitting out there in public. You know, you just like you just have to go kind of look at it. Right. Mostly it's because you're kind of like, wait, this isn't making sense. You know. Yeah. How did this start? How did all these people get in a room? You know. Is there anything that shocks you at this point? I think the main thing that I find really depressing at times is how crappy the media has become, just how shitty and just totally in hoc to certain um, ideologies people, you know, reporters have become. It, to me, it's just that's very depressing. Yeah. You know, I mean, some of them, I mean, I think I do think that like that, that conversation I had with that one reporter um, talking about how unhappy they were inside their own group, I think made me feel normal. I was like, okay, it's not just me. Like, you know, we're talking together and I was like, dude, you're more cynical than I am. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, so I think hearing that, I think kind of helps because it makes you realize, okay, it's not just me. Um, but, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't have solutions, you know, I mean, my job is just basically go out there and tell you like, here's what's going on, you know, and yeah. some people choose not to believe it. Some people just don't want to hear it, you know, they just don't want to hear this stuff. They don't want to hear things that don't, I like to say, I don't like 
I don't like to hear the things that tell me the things that I don't like to hear, <laughs> you know? So tell people how they can find you. So you can find me on Twitter at um, Thacker PD. It's Thacker and then pa for Paul David and at the Disinformation Chronicle, which you can Google and find. On Substack. On Substack. That's great. So um, I just want to leave you with a huge thank you. This has been an amazing chat and um, we would love to have you back and talk more about what you have on deck in 2024. So I hope you join us again. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Wow, that was really an incredible conversation. Um, let us know what you think in the comments. Be sure to also like and subscribe on both our Rumble and our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the great content we post there every week. Also follow us on Substack. We have new stories coming out every week at collapselife.substack.com and also on Twitter at collapse underscore life. Viewers and readers like you are the driving force behind our work and your support to us over the past few months has meant so much. So please help us spread the word, share this video with people you think might find it interesting. Collapse Life is the thinking person's guide to society and demise. It's about opening eyes, taking control and taking action in our own lives. And we look forward to bringing you other amazing voices like Paul's. We can't wait to see you on the next show. And until then, always remember to keep your chin up. It's only collapse. See you soon. <laughs>